Um, our goal tonight, um, as you know, uh, is to talk about what we would call the Harding property or the Boundless property um, and the potential for a new Colonial Hills site, um, on, a new Colonial Hills school on that site at some point in the future. Um, I want to begin just by pointing out um, our locally elected Board of Education members that are here. Um, so our Board of Education President, Jennifer Best, is here somewhere all the way in the back. Um, our Board of Education Vice President is to left, Jennifer's right, Nikki Hudson. Um, Board of Education Member Charlie Wilson is right here in the front. And Board of Education Member Sam Shim is standing in the back. So those are our four board members that are here with us tonight. Um, so our purpose tonight uh, is really to discuss the potential purchase of land for school district use in the future. Um, and I want to just um, frame that for you to say, as you think about this meeting, our goal is to be totally transparent with you. Our goal is to explain where we are at this point and then get a little feedback from our community because this is something that wasn't on our radar screen. It wasn't something we had talked about previously. It wasn't something that we knew would be an opportunity that was coming. But because we're at really, really early stages, we don't have um, really exciting drawings to show you that would show you exactly what could be built in the future. Um, we don't have answers to things that you're going to want to know. And so if, if I was sitting where you are, one of the things I want to know is what will happen to the current Colonial Hill site. And that's just not something that we have an answer to at this time and may not have an answer to for multiple years um, as this process unfolds. And we'll talk more about that tonight. But so just framing that, but, but where we are is this property has become available. That's within the boundaries of Colonial Hills Elementary. Um, in our current boundaries. And we think the responsible thing for Worthington Schools to do is to look at the potential of negotiating the purchase of that property. Okay, and that's what we're here to kind of frame out tonight, talk about and get some feedback. Um, you should have two things in front of you. Some of you do, some of you don't. We'll make sure we pass them out. Um, one is a feedback sheet that we wanna make sure that you fill out either tonight before you leave or obviously you can go home and fill it out and get it back to us, or if you're connected to Colonial Hills Elementary, get it back to Sherry in the office and they'll get it back to us. Um, the other thing is, we are going to stay and answer as many questions as possible tonight, but we're gonna ask you to put them on some note cards, write them down, and just try to make a, um, an orderly questioning as possible um, so that we can answer everything that you have as, as best we can, but that we can do it in a way where um, everybody gets an opportunity. So Christy and Vicki and some folks are passing out those note cards, so if you don't have one, but if there's something that comes up throughout this and you want to make sure that, that you have a question answered, um, make sure you put it on one of those cards. And as we finish, we'll just spend as much time as you'd like going through those questions tonight. So with that, I'm going to turn the mic over to our Assistant Superintendent, Randy Banks, and he's going to kind of walk us through a few things. Good evening. My job tonight is to give you some historical perspective, and I'm probably going to oversimplify some of this in the interest of time. Um, I do see some familiar faces in here. Some of you were involved in our facilities task force, and you will know much, many more details than what we'll present tonight. But I do think it helps provide context to part of this conversation. So it was approximately five years ago, and we knew that the district was going to um, experienced significant leadership change. Dr. Bowers had been named superintendent. And we realized that while the district had done a fantastic job of maintaining our facilities, there was really no long-term plan in how we were to address these aging facilities. So we began to work on a concept. What would that look like? How would we develop that plan? And we learned about the Ohio Facilities Construction Commission um, and we, we realized that they were doing free audits of buildings in the state and comparing them to their criteria. So at that same time, we reached out to many groups throughout our community, our PTA, our city, our libraries, our Worthington Youth Boosters, and we established the community task force to look at facilities. And our primary focus at that time was simply, how are we going to address aging facilities within the Worthington School District moving forward for the next 20 years. Well, they came in and studied our buildings and they confirmed what we thought. We had some aging facilities that were gonna need significant care. 
Um, in fact, some of those buildings rated so poorly, their systems so poorly, that they said if you were to put additional money into this group of buildings, we would recommend that you replace them and not continue to put money in those buildings. Um, with that audit came a free enrollment projection. So we took advantage of that and they came in and they studied the trends in enrollment here in Central Ohio, but specifically in the Worthington School District. And we soon realized that our problem was a little more complicated than just aging facilities, that we had a capacity issue as well. People were moving into our district kind of at record pace um, and we realized that eventually we were gonna run out of space for students in our district. So this slide, you've probably seen it before, we developed the ABCs with our facilities task force and our goals became not only addressing the aging facilities but balancing these two high schools. Thomas was on uh, pace to uh, grow significantly faster than Worthington Kilbourne High School and we were gonna run out of capacity for students at multiple levels. So you heard about issue nine and 10 that passed with the support of our community and the task force was able to move forward with phase one um, of their plan. And that's currently where we're at. We are in the early stages of remodeling and reopening Perry Middle School. So there will be significant additions made to that building. As you know, we are going to reconfigure from a K-6 district to a K-5 district and totally um, redesigning the middle school experience for students in Worthington. Both of those um, specifically deal with capacity. So one and two directly uh, focusing on capacity. Number three, we're expanding and renovating all middle school buildings to increase the capacity Obviously, the expansion parts capacity, but the renovation piece addresses aging facilities. There are parts of our facilities that are being touched there. And then the move um, one elementary school from the Thomas feeder pattern over to Kilbourne, that was done by a feeder pattern committee. Slate Hill has been identified and that transition will take place, uh, begin to take place in the fall of 21. So phase one is underway. The picture at the bottom right hand corner is uh, a projection of what we think Worthing Way Middle School will look like um, when it's completed. This is a slide that we used at Convocation and I'll explain this one briefly. The dark blue schoolhouses correspond with the location of our schools in Worthington schools. The light blue icon represents a group of five new students to our district in the last five years. And, and that's located relatively close to where those students are coming to our district. The rectangles that you see and the, the, the green color, yellow green color, are portable classrooms that we've had to add just within the last two school years. Um, those classrooms have been added throughout the district. This slide really is here to illustrate the need for additional capacity. We continue to have experts look at our enrollment and make updated projections and we continue to see that those numbers are climbing. Um, the, the numbers are climbing faster than we anticipated and the projections are looking higher than those original projections that the state completed for us almost four and a half years ago. So that brings us um, to phase two. With phase two, the task force really put some options available for us. The first was the replacement of the majority of Thomas Worthington High School. That's primarily an aging facilities issue. We have capacity at that building now that Slate Hill has been reassigned. However, there are some major concerns that we have with the facility as the system and the systems in that building. Just this weekend, we once again experienced some significant water damage due to rain. Um, in the basement and some other areas of the building. Thomas Worthington remains on that list. Um, select renovation at Kilbourne High School because they will be serving more students. That was brought up as another possible option in phase two. And then the replacement of two elementary schools. Um, two was designated primarily based on cost. We knew that there was going to be a significant cost. Um, but the, the focus there when we talk about elementary schools was twofold. One, we wanted to address aging facilities. 
So we were looking at buildings that were nearing the end of their systematic life based on the audit that we had done by the state. And then two, we wanted to also increase capacity. So those two reasons are why we're here tonight is that Colonial Hills rose to the top with Brookside Elementary as being a possible school that one, needed attention due to the condition, but two, because of the size, created the opportunity for the district to increase capacity at the same time. Okay, so that brings us to the actually Colonial Hills. So as Randy mentioned, our plan is to get our community task force back together in the fall of 2021, or sometime in 2021, to determine what would go on to phase two of the master facility plan. Now, there, there are limits to phase two. Phase two would be another tax issue, right? It would be a bond issue, likely an operating issue with that bond issue, just like we saw last November. And so what we have to evaluate are things like, what's the community's capacity for tax increases? And then what's the district's debt limit? The state of Ohio gives the district a debt limit. And so we have to determine with those two factors, what's the economy look like at the time? What actually goes in phase two? And we're really not gonna know that until sometime in 2021. It may be that everything that Randy described fits within those parameters. It may be that we look up and construction costs continue to rise at somewhat record paces around Columbus, Ohio, and or that the economy has gone in a different direction and it's determined that we can't ask for all of the things in phase two that we once thought we could. So, so that's kind of a decision that's gonna have to be out there and made by the community before we come back in 2022. We identified Colonial Hills pretty early as probably the most likely elementary school um, to be part of phase two because it's our oldest elementary school. It was built in 1955. It opened with 10 classrooms and at a building cost of $201,000. <laughs> By the way, that's what my Worthington History book says <laughs> from the Historical Society. So I can't, I, I assume that the Historical Society is correct. But pretty fascinating by the way, um, we wish we had those costs um, today. We're spending more than that <coughs> annually on band instruments. Uh, <laughs> so, Colonial Hills is, it was, it was always most likely, and part of it is, you know, we love Colonial Hills, it's a super charming school. Um, I, many of us who have lived in Colonial Hills, the neighborhood, there's just lots of things about it that we find charming that we, that we like. But it was rated by the Ohio Facilities Construction Commission as a school that it would be smarter for the district to replace rather than renovate up to um, a, a current statewide standard okay um, and we need colonial hills to be larger than it is right so right now we have about 420 students a little more than that 430 students in colonial hills elementary when i came to worthington in 2008 we had about 290 students in colonial hills elementary um, at 290 students that school flowed at one point, at its current capacity, everything is really, really tight. Um, obviously, the cafeteria space, the doubles as the auditorium space, the bathrooms are super tight. Um, the original building didn't include the gym, which is an addition, and then obviously what we call the pod, which was also an addition that was built later on in time. And we've, we've now, is this year four maybe, for our modular classrooms, year three or year four, for our four modular classrooms that are housing our sixth grade unit. So Colonial Hills needs to be larger. In addition, all of our high street corridor um, is, is out of capacity, right? So if you, if you look up and down that, obviously we have Evening Street with six modular classrooms right now, plus their sixth grade already out of that building, so they're out of capacity. Worthington Estates is our largest elementary school at over 700 students. They have no classrooms available even within that 700 students, and we have to overflow some students out of Worthington Estates. So, that area of our school district needs more capacity and probably it will for a long time because it's a really desirable area. So that's part of Colonial Hills. The other thing we know about Colonial Hills and it's something that we've come to expect and it's part of our Colonial Hills experience but it would never happen today is obviously our buses and our cars can't get anywhere near the school, right? So they line up every day on Colonial Avenue and up and down Colonial Avenue and our neighbors um, are patient with us as, as best they can be. Um, but that's, that is unique, right, in, in America today. And so that's a challenge that we would like to, we would like to be able to solve. Um, when we look at the current site, the current site is actually 12 acres, 
12 and a half acres. Um, this, there's a, there is a ravine that we all know goes down the middle of the current site behind the school. Um, so it's not all 12 school usable acres from a building standpoint, but there are 12 acres on the site. So Southfield and some of the woods um, to the west of Southfield are all part of that Colonial Hills um, school site. Um, so rebuilding on that site um, is possible. So we, we've had architects look at that. Um, you could rebuild in its current location. Um, you would need to rebuild a two-story school there. You can't build a one-story school. You don't see a lot of two-story elementary schools, although you see some. Um, so you would, you would need to build a two-story school there. But you wouldn't be able to fix in that two-story school likely the busing and the car situation. There's just not enough space on that site. Um, and we'd have to look at things like, would we really have enough parking to meet today's code? I mean, there are some, there are some code pieces that would be a challenge, but likely you could, you could figure that piece out. The challenge with rebuilding on that current site is obviously if you rebuild on that current site, students have to go somewhere for a year to 18 months to 24 months, depending on the construction timeline. Um, and, you know, tangibly that is like something that the district, we, we always felt like in the community task force, that was what was going to have to happen at some point because there was no other land available for Colonial Hills. So, and, and that may still be the case, whether we, if we don't move forward with this property acquisition or we can't for some reason, we can't get a deal together, that may still be the case. But it's really challenging to try to figure out where would those students go. So we talk about things like swing space, and we don't have any empty buildings in the district, so that there's no current district property. You could do things like build another elementary school first, say behind a current elementary school, let's say Worthington Estates or Wilson Hill, or maybe Brookside, um, and then move the Colonial Hills students to the old building while you move the current students to the new building, or vice versa, keep the current students in their old building for an extra year or two, move the clean. Something like that is possible. Brookside's really challenging because Brookside as a school, while it makes the most sense in a lot of ways, we need to rebuild Brookside bigger. Its current building isn't large enough to move Colonial Hills to. It's, it's, they have less students than Colonial Hills. So is it possible that we could do that? It is, but it will be very challenging. It'll be disruptive for Colonial Hills families there will be neighborhoods that um, don't want more buses coming to their neighborhood and more cars to their neighborhood having two schools in that same spot for a couple years. Um, but those are hurdles that if we have to get over, we, will, we can get over. Um, it's possible that you could use Southfield as swing space, some sort of modular classroom village, right? We could bring in, um, no really, I mean, you could bring in lots of modular classrooms and for a year, house the students on South Field in some way, find a way to bring lunch in, those types of things, um, muddle through while you rebuild a new Colonial Hills for the long term, but that, that's an option. Um, a different option is obviously to flip the Colonial Hills site. So you could keep students in the Colonial Hills building and rebuild on South Field because you have as much space on South Field as you do um, in the current Colonial Hills site. Now, there's challenges to that, for sure. Um, one is you'd have to clear, I don't know exactly how many acres of woods, but what is now like part of the cross country course that the students run through for, through the woods. You, you would need that space to be for school construction, for parking lot, those types of things. Um, the other one is South, South Street itself is a really tough street to think about all that traffic on. It's just not, you know, the, the curves on the road, the lack of sidewalks, the lack of curbs, the, um, I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a tough space to think about flipping that, right? There's not easy access to South Field um, for buses and cars. So that's a challenge. Is it, is it doable? Everything I've just mentioned is doable. And everything I've just mentioned may be what we have to do at some point if, if we don't pursue this or if we can't get a deal together, okay? So all those are possible, but they're all really, they're all really tough. And so there's a negative impact um, on park space. Um, and then the ravine is the ravine. So our school and our parent community at Colonial Hills has done a really good job of kind of utilizing the ravine, of making the ravine a positive, of making it part of the student experience at Colonial Hills. It's pretty cool to watch what, what has happened at Colonial Hills over time. Traditionally, if a school district was evaluating a site for a school, 
they would view a review as a liability. Right? It wouldn't be reviewed as um, an advantage. I hear from Colonial Health's families, hey, this is cool. It's an advantage for us to have this. <clears throat> totally grasp that. But from a school site selection standpoint, um, traditionally a ravine in the middle would be something that we would look at as a liability, not a strength. I've lost my clicker. So Boundless is the current owner of the Harding property. Um, and so that space was Harding Hospital for a lot of years, um, owned by Ohio State, um, became Step-by-Step -Step Academy, which was an autism um, service center. Step-by-Step um, -step became part of the Boundless um, company. And so Boundless is the current owner of that property. Boundless put RFPs out, requests for proposals for partners um, for um, to look at that property. They don't need all of that property. And so they're looking for some folks to look at that site. But Boundless um, is a family of companies. It's, it, it is a nonprofit, by the way, um, that does person-centered care to children, adults, and families with intellectual and developmental disabilities. Um, so they are in the a service industry working with families um, and, and working with challenges. So this is the site. So most of you know this site. Um, obviously, if you're here tonight, uh, but we're looking at the site in the um, bottom, I'm going to say right-hand corner um, of that screen, the 13.7 acre site um, to the bottom of your screen. And so that site is at the end of Indianola Avenue. It backs up to Park Overlook, um, and it has access from 161. Um, you can see what Boundless plans to do in the middle there, um, and then they plan to have another partner for that, that front acreage of 5.1 acres that's on that front, that the high street frontage part, right? Many people that, that don't live in Worthington or even lots of people that do live in Worthington drive by on 161, see the big building, and they think that's the Harding property and that's all that's there because many people have never really driven back through those buildings. I assume most of you know that space pretty well. The buildings are in disrepair. Um, they are being utilized, but they're in disrepair at this point. Um, so I think redevelopment here will be really positive. So it's this 13.7 acre site that, that we would be looking at. So advantages um, of this site for a school district are it meets the Ohio Facilities Construction Guidelines for size. So there's a couple different guidelines that, that the OFCC looks at when they look at a site. Um, there's some urban guidelines, and there's some traditional guidelines. Um, but this 13.7 acres would allow you to put a 600 student elementary school comfortably with kind of modern conveniences in a site that's within the, within the neighborhood, okay? Um, it, we think it would be ideal for buses. So buses would be able to travel off of 161 um, into the school site, taking buses out of the Colonial Hills neighborhood. Um, so that's, a we think, a real positive. Obviously, it, it reduces a lot of the traffic that's in Colonial Hills because at least some of the families are going to choose to come in off, off that 161 entrance. From a school district standpoint, we think we would like access from Indianola Avenue. We recognize that the community doesn't want um, Indianola Avenue to be a, a through street. Um, so we would be very comfortable with some sort of controlled access where parents in the neighborhood can bring their students to school and get back that way. Because honestly, if you live on Indianola, you don't want to go all the way around um, to get to and from school. But we think some sort of controlled access. I will tell you, the city will have impact on those types of decisions long term on what they will allow a, a street to do or not do and those types of things. But that would be our intent. Um, so we think that makes sense. It keeps uh, the Colonial Hills neighborhood together, um, you know, whether we call it the you know, Rush Creek, Colonial Hills, but that whole attendance area together, it gives us some more capacity um, on the high street corridor. This area is in the Architecture Review Board District, um, so that whole site would be subject to the City of Worthington's ARB, um, and so we think it makes um, a, a bunch of sense. So we submitted an RFP to Boundless. Um, they, they began a process back, I don't know, February, March, um, and we submitted our RFP with a number of other private entities that submitted RFPs. Um, Boundless, I don't know, met with us again sometime in the spring. Um, I met with them in July-ish sometime. Um, and in August, right before school started, like two days before we put the blog post out, they said, hey, we would like to partner with you. And so what does partner mean? Well, what partner means is we would sign an intent to negotiate. 
we would have a period of time for, for us to negotiate with Boundless on whether we actually purchase the land or not. So we haven't made any commitments. Um, this for us was a really difficult process. I tell people that if, um, if they had put a for sale sign in the yard, then we would have looked at that, come to you as a community and said, hey, we're considering this because this isn't something we had socialized with our community gotten community feedback before we um, stepped forward and, and made a proposal. But because Boundless was gonna be the selector of the proposals, we felt like we were in this weird spot where how do you come forward and ask a question about something that you may not be selected to even have an opportunity to participate in that question. And so we just, you know, we, we were in this kind of weird spot where we weren't sure what to do with it. Um, by having this community meeting, it probably hurts our negotiating process Right? Like we feel like we have to come to you and ask the question, and we should because we're a community organization and this is kind of out of left field. But at the same time, typically you don't want to show someone you're negotiating with that you're this far down the path um, and this far interested in something. So that's kind of where we are in this process. Um, we are intending, if your feedback is positive or mostly positive, to begin a negotiation process that would um, allow us to purchase this property. What we would do after that will determine, be determined by what happens in 2021. So we come back together in 2021 as a community task force. We evaluate where we are as, from enrollment as a school district, where we are from a financial position as a school district, where the community is in a financial position, the, all of those factors, and we come back, the plan is to come back to, to the Worthington community in the fall of 2022 with another bond issue and operating levy. And that would, the operating side funds daily operations, the bond issue would fund whatever is determined to be in phase two of this master facility plan. We think it's likely Colonial Hills is in phase two of the plan. I do wanna be honest with you and tell you, before we began our master facility planning process, I would have bet my house we were gonna remain a K-6 school district. I just would have, I would have never thought we were gonna become a K-5 school district. So it's possible that we get back together and the, the, the task force says, I know we have this property, but we have these other needs that are greater right now and we can't afford to do Colonial Hills and it gets pushed to a phase three. And a phase three is probably in that 20, 27-ish, 26, 27 range um, for our community because there will be a phase three. This master facility plan was always designed to be at least three phases. Okay, so I, I don't know for sure whether Colonial Hills goes in phase two, but we think it's likely that it does. And therefore we think it, this, this property makes a lot of sense for Worthington schools to consider as that next piece. Um, one of the things you didn't see me say is what happens to the current Colonial Hills site. I, and I, I told you that up front that we don't have those answers, but part of that is we don't know what our enrollment's gonna be. So you can look forward and say, if Worthington Schools continues to grow at its current pace, we opened this year with 10,715 students. In 2012, we had 9,000 students. Our projections show that we, that we could grow to 12,000 students. The highest we've ever had in Worthington Schools was 10,800 students back in 1997-ish. Okay, so we've seen this significant enrollment. We see, obviously, young families all over and I'm beginning to believe that the projections might actually be true, right? Because they, they continue to come. Um, but so, you know, depending on what enrollment is and where trends are, we'll kind of have, a, have an impact on what's Worthington schools need to do with that facility. It could need to remain some school space, maybe for a period of time until enrollment begins to dip. We think over time enrollment will roller coaster a bit because most of our enrollment is based on housing turnover. And so because of housing turnover, you, you move into a house, you raise your family, at some point you decide to move out. It really depends on how long you stay in that house while your kids are no longer in school <coughs> and on what that roller coaster will be. But because we're a pretty much built out community, there's not going to be significant building that occurs um, within our Worthington Schools boundaries that we know of, although there is one property north of Worthington Hills that, that could produce 400 houses. Um, and if that happens, that kind of changes a lot of pieces. Um, but otherwise, you know, we're a fairly built out community. 
Um, so enrollment should go up and down, right? It should rise for a period of, say, 10 years, and then decline for a period of 10 years. Rise for a period of 10 years, kind of decline. We're certainly on that rise, pardon me. It's possible four years from now that decline has begun, not necessarily in, the, in you know throughout the whole school district, but because our high street corridor turned over before the rest of the district and we saw growth there before the rest of the district, one thought process is it'll begin to level off or even decline a little as your children kind of go through school but you stay in your house, right? So I, have, I no longer have kids in elementary school. Four years ago, I had three kids in elementary school. I hope to get to stay in my house, right? And so those kids no longer are produce, you know, so that's kind of what happens as, you, as your kids move through that career. So we don't know what's gonna to happen to that space. It's possible that we look at the space and say, Worthington Schools isn't gonna need that space anymore. And, and what I would say at that point is then we have to come together to, as a community and determine what happens to that space. Okay, does the school district sell that space? Does the school district, you know, what happens to that space? Um, and that's a kind of an open question. What I will say is that we are a community organization. I introduced our Board of Education members because they're locally elected Board of Education members. The good news is when, you know, when you're working with the school district, you have a lot of input in what happens, okay? And so I think, I think there is some safety there. So what's next steps? Well, we're gonna get community input. So tonight is part of the community input process. We wanna know, do you think it makes sense for us to allocate 1.9-ish million dollars, somewhere, you know, we haven't negotiated a price, but somewhere in, that was, that was our proposal based on the appraisal of the land that we got. Um, somewhere in that realm, if we allocate those dollars to, to purchase this 13.7 acres. Um, after we review community input, um, you'll see us continue to update the Board of Education in public meetings. Um, so you'll see me do that Monday night. And then there's just a lot of pieces that, that we need to look at. What are the easement rights on the property? Um, what's the title search look like? There are current buildings on the property. Um, and so what are demolition, demolition costs for those buildings? Who's responsible for demolition of those buildings? What's the timing of the demolition of those buildings? Those types of things. Obviously, we're going to do environmental assessments of the property, um, and then look at our, you know, our financing options. Like what's the best way, or what's the best way for Worthington Schools to allocate those resources if we are going to move forward and look at that property? So, my guess is, as you're sitting here, and I, and I hate this, but my guess is you have more questions than we've given you answers, um, and, and that's just kind of where we are. Right, so where we are in a nutshell is early in August, Wildless said, hey, we, we think we would like to move forward with this property with Worthington Schools. And so very quickly, we tried to communicate out, hey, we have this opportunity. We think it makes a lot of sense. What do you think? And that's what we come to, kind of stand before you to, to ask that question. So if you have lots of questions, what I would like you to do is if you could write them down in a note card, and I see some people doing that, and then I just want to start answering them, and I'll answer as long as you want. Um, if you get tired of listening to us answer questions, um, you don't have to stay for all of it. Don't feel like you do, but we do want your feedback sheet. So you have a feedback sheet, um, and so whether you fill it out tonight or whether you fill it out like here while you're here tonight or whether you fill it out and, and move give it to somebody tomorrow or the day after. If we want your feedback sheet, that's really important to us. Okay, so how do we do questions? Okay, so a couple of really good questions to start with. The first question is, what do our teachers think? And, and then it was said, you know, some of our teachers have been in that space for 20 plus years. Um, and so some of our teachers are here, um, so I don't know if I should speak for them, um, but I, I think a couple things. Our teachers have been great at Colonial Hills. They utilize their space well. Some of our classrooms at Colonial Hills are outstanding. Right? We have fairly large, you know, the, the, the early classrooms that were built are fairly large classrooms with pretty good light. 
Um, but what we really lack at Colonial Hills is space for small group instruction, space for things like EPP, space for things like our music program, space um, for a cafeteria space that, that is adequate for the number of students that we roll through. Um, and things that we love, like the ravine, um, make it really, really hard to supervise students. Right, so we're held to a higher standard than, than I think um, schools were held to in 1955 when it came to the supervision of students. Um, and so, you know, that quirky site that is a lot of fun for us at times also presents real challenges when you try to figure out how do you get a couple people on South Field to watch students, a couple people on playgrounds to watch students, and those types of things. So, um, and then what happens if we buy the property and the next levy doesn't pass? That's a really good question. So. It is possible that we purchase this property um, and sometime in the future the school district does something with it or doesn't and then has to sell it to some sort of, uh, probably right it would go back to boundless in the contract, although we haven't negotiated that. Um, but it's possible that we purchase the land and never build on it. I mean, that, that's legitimately possible because um, I will tell you that while we feel like we've got a really good plan in place for the future, um, previous generations in Worthington had really good plans, but they couldn't always finance those plans, right? Because you have to go back in front of the community to look at those plans. Um, so that, that is possible that that happens. I hope it doesn't, but it's possible. Okay, so the, the next question is, is there an urgency to purchase the boundless site? Is it possible to have an option to purchase the site before any other buyer steps up? Um, the urgency is that, that Boundless does have other buyers. And so they selected Worthington Schools um, partly because I think they like the idea that we're not ready to do something right away, and it buys them a little bit of time. Um, I think they like the idea that we're a community organization and there is some ability to share some services um, bet between the two organizations. Um, but if Worthington Schools doesn't purchase the site, somebody else will purchase the site immediately. Um, and, uh, and is ready to do development. I mean, so they had other RFPs for the site, um, and so I think they'll move forward. Okay, so can the boundless property be used as a swing site while Colonial Hills is rebuilt on the current site? Um, and then where can we find the current version of the master plan? So the most current version of the master facility plan um, is on the website. Uh, I don't remember the exact tab right now. Um, I think under leadership in the master facility plan. But the most current version is from 2016. right? So we don't have an updated version. It's what the board approved in 2016 as, as the three phases. It lists all the community task force members. Um, our two community task force chairs are in the room tonight. So Amy Lloyd is here, Nikki Hudson, before she was a board member, was our community task force chair. So they led us through that process. Um, so it is, it is out there. Um, can the boundless property be used as a swing site while Colonial Hills is rebuilt on the current site? Um, it, it could, I'm sure, um, but that would necessitate that Worthington Schools is, is if I'm understanding correctly, um, wanting to build a 12th elementary school in the school district and not continue with just 11 elementary schools. Um, so potentially the, the site, owning any site that we don't, you know, we don't currently own land anywhere that we, that we don't have a site, um, does provide some flexibility to the, to the future. Um, but our thinking at this point would be for a new Colonial Hill site because it takes care of that, those things that our current site can't fix or, or we don't think we could fix with the space we have in the ravine, which um, is mostly around busing and, and um, cars and adequate playground space and those types of things. Um, just describe your concern of noise and air pollution due to the site's proximity to the railroad tracks, and do you view the railroad tracks as a liability? How will we address this? Um, so, I mean, I would say the, li the railroad tracks are a liability for sure. I mean, ideally, we would have um, school sites that aren't um, backing up to railroad tracks. Um, we do have six current school sites that, that border railroad tracks. Um, so it really would depend on where positioning of the school goes, how close they are to the railroad tracks. But Wilson Hill right now, Brookside right now, Granby McCord, Worthington Kilbourne High School, Slate Hill, um, all border railroad tracks. Um, by the way, our buses cross railroad tracks a couple hundred times every day. 
um, in Worthington schools and in Westerville, they cross railroad tracks. Never. There are no, there are no railroad tracks in Westerville. I'm just fascinated that they're right next to us. Sorry. Uh, so I, you know, I think I think that's real. I mean, it's it, railroad tracks are not ideal, but we do feel like because we have so many school sites with railroad tracks, it's something that we can work through. The kids won't be close to the tracks. Um, there is there would be some noise. We'd have to figure out how we mitigate noise on that. So. Okay, there has to be more of these cards. Who's got it? Yeah, I've got it. <clears throat> okay, has the city expressed a willingness to invest in student safety should the boundless opportunity come to fruition, i.e. sidewalks on East New England Avenue or Andover Street? Um, if not yet, how can the community help um, invigorate that conversation? So. I would say we've only had real initial conversations with the city of Worthington. Um, I think they're good partners when it comes to student safety. Um, I know sidewalks are really hard for the city just because everybody has mixed feelings on sidewalks. Like everybody wants sidewalks unless they're in their yard where they don't currently have sidewalks. So I know that that's a challenge. Um, as a school district, we would advocate for sidewalks always. Um, although we have lots of neighborhoods that don't have sidewalks and, and don't have any real authority there. So I think the city would be a good partner. Um, as far as how far the city would go, I, I can't speculate on that. Um, plans are currently underway to develop an outdoor learning space at the current school. If the site moves to the Harding Boundless site, will opportunities and access exist to move the learning space to the ravine there? That's a great question. Um, so I, I, I know that there's a group that's working hard to create some outdoor learning space at Colonial Hills. That's something um, that we value, that we support. Um, I would assume the answer to this is yes but I honestly don't know the answer to that. Like it's a little preliminary for me to say um, what that, how that current site will be set up. There is some ravine um, in that area. I think we could create good outdoor learning space. Um, without a ravine, um, Granby Elementary has created really good outdoor learning space recently. So I think it's possible regardless of the setup um, but, and something we would support, but I can't specifically answer that. Could the Colonial Hills playground be moved to the south field? Um, so I think the answer is yes, although it's not something that we've ever had a conversation or considered. Um, so I, that would obviously be a long way from the building. Um, so when I answer yes, I'm just saying, I mean, I don't see any reason why it couldn't be possible, but it's not something that we've ever talked about, thought about. Um, frankly, it's the first time I've ever um, that it's ever crossed my mind on that. So it's not something I'd recommend from a supervision standpoint. Again, we still struggle from that concept of moving students through a ravine, um, but it kind of is what it is. What kind of approach to green space as the site fronts park overlook will be considered by by minimum setback required for parking and try to increase the green space between the hard surface to road and parking. Um, I would just say that, again, this is, this is a site that's in the ARB district. Um, as we get closer to site design, those are all things that, that we would have interest in. Um, there are also things that are really important to Boundless. Boundless wants to look at this whole site as one kind of site with walking paths and green space. And so, um, you know, I don't know if it's all detailed on that map, but um, those are the kind of things that they talk about. Um, what we've said is um, we want to be a good partner in that. We recognize how important this site is to, the, to really the Worthington community. Um, but exactly what that will look like, I'm not sure. Decision date. Um, will boundless wait is a really good question. Like we're going to, um, I don't think they will wait very long, right? So, um, you know, what we're going to have to do is decide are we willing to negotiate with them or not. Now. We would sign a, an agreement to negotiate for a period of time. Say we're going to attempt to negotiate for six months. If we can't you know, get a deal done within that period of time, then we would have to determine, do we both walk away and they choose a different partner? Or you know, do we agree that we're close and we'll continue to negotiate those types of things? Um, but they're gonna move relatively quick here. Um, through negotiation, two million offer, four million cash. Is that what you said? Yeah. I can't 
So I, 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 if I did, I'm sorry for that. But what, so we had the land appraised and the appraisal came in at 1.89-ish million dollars. And so what we put in our proposal was the appraisal number. Now, what will actually be negotiated it would have to be determined. Some of those other factors that we listed, who's responsible for the buildings that are currently there. It could be that Worthington Schools is, and then we feel like the value of the property is lower because we're going to have to invest cost in demolition. It could be that there's something, you know, that, so I don't know what the, the actual cost would be, um, but we think it's in that ballpark that we've put out, is in that one, $1.9 million range. Okay, so what's the earliest feasible date that construction would begin at the new Colonial Hills Elementary? So if we pass a bond issue in the fall of, in November of 22, we would hope to open a school in the fall of 24. Okay, so about 18 months from that period of time. Um, that would probably be the earliest that we could do that. Does the district need all 3.7 acres? We do. Um, I mean, again, some of that's gonna be green space, some of that's going to be, um, parking, some of that's you know, all sorts of things. But most of our school sites um, are somewhere between 12 and 17 acres, our elementary schools. Um, so um, this, this site is not large, 13.7 acres would not be large for this school site, but it would be adequate um, for this school site. This is a great question that I'm gonna to have to get back to somebody on because I don't know the history. It says, how does the school board reconcile possible land purchase value that is almost equal to the previous tax liability that was forgiven on the property? Um, so, where's Jeff? Jeff's right here. <laughs> Sorry, Jeff is our treasurer of the school district, so. There had to be a numbers question. Uh, so with regard can everybody hear me? Okay. With, with regard to the prior tax liability on the property that was held by step by step before it became boundless, um, we as a school district generally do not get involved in those altercations as it would be. Um, we have a law firm in place that, that's, that fights each of those properties on a commercial property basis. Uh, we went to the Board of Revision, we went to the Board of Tax Appeals, um, they had applied for an exemption under non not for profit rules, and for the majority of that property, they won that case, and so we, it is no longer appealable by us. And that was not something that that we forgave. So we fought through the entire legal process, and and we were not successful in that. So it was not a dollar amount that we were that we forgave, but indeed it was a dollar amount closely approximating the value of the property. Okay, so this question says, can you clarify the capacity of the new building regardless of the site? Um, I've heard you say 600 tonight and here have seen projection figures up to 777. Um, I, I don't know for sure. That would be a, a construction question. We project six to 650 would be the size of an elementary school that we would want to build today. Um, that would add capacity. It's not like, could you build larger? You could, we wouldn't recommend that. Probably in that 600 range is kind of the sweet spot. Um, for an elementary school today. Where will the purchase money capital come from since phase one of the bond issue was not designed for elementary rehab? That's, that's absolutely correct. So phase one of the bond issue, remember, went to rebuild our middle schools. So you're gonna see a complete rebuild of Worthing Way Middle School, a complete renovation, an addition of 80,000 square feet, Perry Middle School, Phoenix Middle School, that area, additional rehab of, of McCord, additional rehab of, Col or of Kilbourne Middle. We have a meeting September 17th. We'd love for you to come. And you can have an update on all of those, or you'll see an update of our board meeting on September 9th. That was about half of our bond issue, buses, technology, band instruments, um, and general maintenance items at all 19 of our schools were all part of that bond issue. So to raise money for a new Colonial Hills, you would have to pass a new bond issue in 2022 that would fund phase two of the master facility plan. What's in phase two of the master facility plan may be Colonial Hills Elementary. We project that that makes a lot of sense to us. But remember, rebuilding the academic wings at Thomas Worthington were part of that projection, potentially another elementary school, and so we'll have to determine what will happen there. Okay. 
Yeah, so the question here is what types of challenges will there be to have a typical elementary school in pro close proximity to a site with challenged kids? Could the presence of a school have a negative impact on the therapeutic process of boundless? Um, obviously, Boundless feels really comfortable with having a school on the site. We feel like the students that Boundless serves are also students that Worthington Schools would serve. So they obviously have some students that have chosen to be at Boundless, or their therapeutic needs need to be at Boundless, but there's, there aren't students at Boundless that we don't also, I'm trying to frame, say this correctly, we serve students with the same level of disabilities in Worthington Schools as Boundless serves at their site. We don't currently share students, but we, we do serve at the same level. Um, have we polled current teachers and staff for their opinions? We have not at this point, to be 100% honest with you. Um, would acquisition of properties adjacent be necessary to rebuild at the current site? Which ones? Um, yeah, that's a good question. So one of the things I put in the, in the blog post was some of the architects as as they looked at the current site said, hey, you're really going to need to purchase or take by eminent domain some of the current houses close to Colonial Hills if you're going to be able to put buses and cars on that site. Now, that doesn't mean the district would choose to do that, but their recommendation was if you want to access this six acres and be able to get buses and cars into that site, you're going to need some of these houses that are right here. Exactly which ones, I don't know the answer to that. Um, but that does make sense to me as far as that's a really Greenwich Avenue as it kind of dead ends into Colonial Hills is a narrow space right now. Um, and if we are going to create a site now, you could choose to rebuild on that site and just say, we're not going to fix the busing and cars issue. I mean, you could do that. Um, so we'll see. Okay, so I said one large housing site north of Worthington Hills, but what about UMCH? Last estimate LC proposal was 200 houses and 350 apartments, 550 units. What's your um, consideration for this growth and does it cause redistricting? Um, either one of those two things. So um, I talked about potentially north of Worthington Hills. There's property up there that many refer to as the Haddon property. It's the old Haddon farm. Um, they've talked about developing it for years. Maybe they will, maybe it'll be another 20 years. I mean, it's honestly on that kind of path of, you hear rumors like it's going to happen, and if it does, X, Y, Z could happen, and if it, you know, and then, uh, so I don't know the answer to that, but that's just north of Worthington Hills, um, right off 315 in what we would call Mount Air. If you're driving north on 315, if you looked left, that's it. And you can, you can see it on kind of Google Maps. Um, and then UMCH, that's a great question. Um, what's going to happen with UMCH is um, totally up in the air, obviously. Um, currently, when there is multifamily housing for the school district, like apartments at the mall at that level, or the district apartments that are in Linworth, we're not seeing a lot of kids out of there. I think we have six total students currently at the mall in, in those two apartment buildings. So depending on what's built depends on what's projected for housing. Single family housing obviously would bring the most number of kids to Worthington schools. Um, and so, you know, we'll see where that goes. And then when you talk about multifamily housing, like, a, like um, apartments, um, it's really about price point. So the higher the price point, the less number of students that are in that price point. So it's again, hard to determine. Either one of these properties, if they're built, probably have to cause us to redistrict. Um, just kind of the reality of that piece. Um, so. So again, what's the school district think about building next to active railroad track, task, uh, tracks, um, noise and safety? Um, and again, it's just it's something that we feel like um, is fairly consistent with, with almost half of our schools in Worthington, so it's something we think we can work through. Uh, this is a great question. So what do you see as the future of Southfield if Boundless moves forward? Um, well, um, you know, so it, it could remain Southfield, and, and our current school site remains a school site for some sort of students in the district because Worthington's enrollment needs that. It could be that we come back to the community and say, "Hey, we don't have a use for this space at this point, and um, we need to have a community discussion on what happens to it." So I know that that's totally ambiguous. It's just honestly one of those things that I don't have any idea. Um, what will happen in the future on that.
Jeff, this question is yours. So would purchase money come from the current bond money, and if so, would some currently planned phase one initiatives be delayed? Good question. Um, no. No money would come from the current bond issue as the scope of the projects because of the increased student enrollment require us to put as much funds into the, the renovation of the four middle schools as possible. So we have no funds available from that standpoint. Um, I know one person asked a question earlier, is it possible that we would have an op, you know, could, could have, get an option to purchase? That would be one thing under consideration. Um, we, we purchased this facility, it was under a, a debt way of doing things called certificates of participation. That would be under consideration as well as using uh, current general fund dollars could be under consideration. So we will put together a number of proposals of possibilities of ways to do that and, and allow the board to make an educated decision about what, what they think is the correct pathway to make that purchase if we decide to move that forward. So the next question was the same question. Where does $1.9 million come from? Um, so the next question is, is $1.9 million just the purchase of the land? Yes. So the, the construction cost is somewhere probably 12 to $15 million um, in current dollars. Um, we, are seeing, um, we are seeing construction costs throughout central Ohio really rise fairly drastically. Um, the economy's good. Ohio State's building a lot of buildings, those types of things. So um, cost of buildings is going up. That does impact our middle school projects. Um, but so we would need, again, that additional bond issue to finance the cost of actually building a building. Um, we don't have those dollars right now. Um, again, what are we going to do with Southfield um, in the future? Yeah, this is a great question that I don't know the answer to, but I'll say it out loud. If Colonial Hills doesn't move to boundless property, what is the city's perspective on future zoning of that 13.7 acres and five acre parcel of land. So that land is currently zoned for a school or some sort of nonprofit. That, that, so from a school district standpoint, we're comfortable with that. What happens from a zoning standpoint at a city level for something else would have to go through the city process. Um, and so do you know what that process is? Do you want to share it? You'll be, be that there. Okay, so I don't know what will happen with that. This is a good question. So would any part of the new Colonial Hills and Boundless be considered dual use, i.e. shared facilities? Um, that's something that we'd have to negotiate. So Boundless does have a vision um, that everybody on this property would, would kind of share equally for property maintenance, for, for maintaining walking paths, um, for maintaining the roads that go in and out of, of the property, those types of things. Um, that is a non-traditional vision for a public school district, so that's something that we're going to have to work out through that um, talking process with them before we can come to some sort of um, agreement on what that looks like long term. Um, I don't think we would eventually share facilities, although we could easily share green space. Um, I do think it's possible that if we come to agreement there's a building that they're using on that land that we would either lease back to them or allow them to use for a period of time until the school district is ready to have them demolish said building so that we can build a new building. Uh, good question. So who represents the district in negotiations with Boundless? Um, so we work with Bricker and Eckler uh, as, our, as our legal firm. Um, so they would be our lead counsel in negotiations with Boundless. Um, obviously, Mr. McEwen and Mr. Ebley, our business director, um, would play major roles in that process, or our Board of Education. Um, ultimately, everything has to be signed off on by a Board of Education, um, but our attorneys would represent us in the negotiation process through Bricker. Yeah, so what is being done to ensure proper maintenance of other schools to ensure they last as long as makes sense and avoid a rebuild like this? So I don't know if we're ever going to be able to avoid rebuild. And just, you know, to say that out loud, because what happens is at some point systems become obsolete um, and, and spaces, the need for spaces change. But our bond issue that was in 2006, our bond issue in 2012, and then our bond issue in 2018, all had significant chunks of money for maintenance, 
for what we call safe, warm, dry improvements for new roofs throughout the district, through new chillers, um, through new boilers in buildings. You see lots of new flooring in buildings. You see new windows in some of our buildings. You see new furniture in our buildings. So our goal is to maintain our spaces um, as well as we can within the parameters that we have. Now, as a public institution, our needs always outweigh the money that we have. And our wants certainly outweigh um, the money that we have. But um, for the most part, our buildings are in reasonable shape. We could continue to utilize Colonial Hills for another 15 to 20 years. What the OFCC has said is you're going to continue to dump money into this, and you'd be better long term to spend that money on a new facility. That's what their assessment basically is that. But it doesn't say that the building isn't usable long term. Okay. So, that, you know, that, that's what we're looking to do. In our master facility plan, phase one, phase two, eventually phase three, maybe a phase four, what we're looking to do is set up the future of Worthington. So there's never a point where they look up and say, uh-oh, we've got this many buildings that are in really dire condition, and here's the challenge that we have. Um, it, but, but it's going to be really incremental. Like right now, we're working on middle schools. Um, Thomas Worthington High School in and of itself could be a phase. Um, then you have a number of elementary schools, Colonial Hills, Brookside, Wilson Hill, Worthington Estates. I'm forgetting something, which I shouldn't do. Um, but that, that are in that, built in the 50s and 60s range um, that are at the end of their useful life. These are the same conversations that you see in Upper Arlington right now, the same conversations you see in Westerville, the same conversations you see in Grandview, um, because all of our buildings are in those kind of cycles. Worthington is a little unique in that we have about half of our facilities that were built in the 50s and 60s, and then a second half of our facilities in the second building boom of Worthington in the late 80s into 1991. So our newest building is Worthington Kilborn High School, built in 1991. And so you can you drive around and you see Bluffview, Slate Hill, Worthington Park, um, McCord Middle School, Granby, all of those buildings were built in the in the late 80s. You've got a couple in the middle, Worthington Hills and Liberty kind of built in the 70s. Worthington Hills was that sweet open concept with no walls anywhere. Um, it didn't work very well. <laughs> Um, this is that same question about which properties would need to be taken down, and I honestly don't know. And, and on that, again, from a school district standpoint, I don't know that Worthington schools would ever go down that path. I'm just saying that, that our architects clearly said, in a traditional school district setting, if you wanted to rebuild right on this site and be able to do the things that, you sh that you're expected to be able to do in 2021, 2022 school districts, which is things like put buses in and cars, and have separation of buses and cars for safety, you can't do it in its current configuration. So, Okay, so suggested cost of the new build, somewhere in that 12 to $15 million range, kind of determined those are today's dollars for a new elementary school. Um, I, I, I would guess closer to the 15 million than the 12, just based on construction costs. Um, how much land do we actually get on the lot near India to Ola? Um, I don't know the answer to that question. I'm going to have to research that one and get back to, um, on that. What's the plan for the old school, which, which again, we really don't have a plan at this point. What's the cost difference in cost to tear down the existing building and rebuild on the site as opposed to building on the land, tearing down the old building and rebuilding on the new site to relocate kids at a temporary school? Um, so that's a really good question. Um, I, I don't have figures for you. Like we haven't gone forward far enough to say if we really rebuilt on the current site, um, what would it cost us compared to rebuilding on a new site? Um, I will make assumptions, and my assumptions could be wrong, but my assumptions are that it will be a little bit cheaper, not a lot, to rebuild on a flat site versus trying to rebuild a two-story school on a, on a ravine site. Uh, because that ravine adds just intricacies that, that you know, are challenging in the construction process, but I'm not sure that that's totally true. Um, and then obviously there is cost in moving students. Okay, that may, that may be incremental cost, like just busing, right? So it may just be that we have to bus students to a, to a different location. That's fairly cheap cost if it's just busing to a different location. 
um, if it's this modular village concept, because we haven't secured another site to do that, that's significantly more, right? That could, that could easily be in the high hundreds of thousands of dollars for that many modular classrooms, um, but we'll see. Um, the south field is used for cross country. Will the current site have a space for all of these ac other activities? Um, you know, that's, I mean, yes, no, right? It won't have the same space, um, but there is lots of space throughout um, the property. So if, if we're talking cross country specifically, um, certainly we could create courses in that space. Um, why not purchase the Brownless property for purposes other than permanently relocating Colonial Hills? The maintenance equipment currently located behind Evening Street. We would like to move that um, swing space facility for any schools um, under renovation and then programming like a Worthington Academy or alternative program, other uses as needed long term. Um, the current answer to that question, I mean, so there are other, we, we have other things that we've identified that we haven't figured out solutions for. The maintenance building that's behind Evening Street is, is one of them. If we know sometime, if you've been back there, if you've seen it, it's in really bad shape. Um, obviously, buildings for kids have always risen on the priority list above buildings that, that aren't for kids, and therefore, nothing's been done with that facility. Something will need to be at some point. Um, what I would say is there is uniqueness here. Um, if we partner with Boundless, what we've, what we've proposed to them is to put an elementary school there. It wouldn't necessarily have to be Colonial Hills Elementary, but in our current thought process, we haven't planned to add a 12th elementary school to Worthington Schools. We currently have 11 elementary schools, and our plan moving forward was to stay with 11 elementary schools. So unless that changes, the feeling was this made the most sense to be a new site because it was in the neighborhood, and because Colonial Hills was identified as a school that needs to be replaced. Um, so that was our current thinking there. Um, this is a good question, although I may defer to Mr. Edley, so I'm just giving him a warm up to, to wake up back there. Um, when we know that the cost of renovating Colonial Hills is 75% of the cost of replacing it, how is it smarter to replace? How is smarter defined? And I'm aware of the 66% guideline, however, it's just that it's a guideline. So what this person is referring to is the Ohio Facilities Construction Commission's guideline. When they come out and they assess the school, they assess um, they, their engineers, their, their facility experts walk all of our schools, they look at them and they determine what's the life cycle of every aspect of the school. And then they, they rate that school, they give it a percentage and they say if, if it's above 66%, it makes more sense for your community long term to replace the building than it would be to renovate it up to this statewide standard. Um, it is just a guideline. There are communities all the time that decide not to do that. So Worthington Schools would have the ability to do whatever Worthington Schools wants. We can't access Ohio Facilities Construction Commission rebates if we don't build to the Ohio Facilities Construction Commission standards, but we don't have to do that. And there are times where communities will have a historic building and say, no, the historic building is too important to the charm of our community. We have to keep it. We're going to renovate it up. Kilbourne Middle School fits that category in Worthington. It's on the Village Green. It's really important to the history of Worthington. It fits that category. We don't deem any of the rest of our actual school buildings to have a historical um, designation of some sort to, to fit that capacity. From my seat, Colonial Hills is charming. We have a lot of affection for it, but it's not a historic building. Um, now, it's still just a guideline. So um, the question on the table was, what makes it smarter to rebuild versus renovate. This is Jeff Ebley. Jeff is our Director of Business Services. Trent answered that very well, thank you very much. <laughs> um, I don't know that it does. I mean, I think what's right for a given community is what's right for that community. Um, I, I made some statements about the positives if we were looking to relocate uh, Colonial Hills at a meeting the other night. And I had a lady who her concern was that um, from a um, desirability of Colonial Hills and from a, um, all of the benefits of that site, we should never uh, eliminate Colonial Hills. That's a decision for the community. Economically, 
I think you can take a look at a calculation of what it costs to build a new building and what it costs to update Colonial Hills and what kind of life you will get out of it. But that's strictly a numbers game. Um, so I don't know that it's smarter um, to renovate than it is to rebuild, but that's a community decision. Okay, so this is a good point and question. Isn't Worthington Kilbourne High straddling in a ravine and couldn't the school be rebuilt incorporated the ravine? Yes and yes. Worthington Kilbourne High School, part of that building does straddle a ravine um, and you could rebuild Colonial Hills in some sort of similar fashion. Um, could the school be rebuilt with one story below ground? Um, I don't know the answer for that, honestly, outside of my understanding on that. Um, so I, I don't know. Um, is it less expensive to build a new school than to rebuild, renovate on the current site? Again, we don't have figures for that at this time. Um, we anticipate yes, especially if we're trying to rebuild over the ravine, um, but we don't have specific figures to share with you. Um, Rush Creek residents' main concern is to maintain the integral character of the neighborhood. Uh, we'd like an assurance that that will happen. Um, you, you know, what I'd say on that is we recognize the character of our neighborhoods. Um, if you see the school, um, if, if you, you know, look at what we're proposing to build Worthing Way, um, which we're proposing to build a school that fits in the character of that neighborhood, which means if you um, were to go down to Canal Winchester or out to Marysville and see a school, you're gonna see a school that's about three stories high uh, with pitched roofs. What we're building is low song in the neighborhood, more of a mid-century modern type of look because we think that fits better in the Worthington Estates neighborhood. Um, so our commitment is to the community, um, but exactly, I, I'm not sure you know, exactly the assurances that we can, we can provide. Um, and could Southfield be preserved as a parkland? Um, it certainly could be. Um, I do tell people that typically the school district doesn't run parks. Um, I'm just honestly outside of our core mission, so the city typically runs parks and the school district doesn't. So it doesn't mean that it couldn't become a park at some point doesn't mean that the school district couldn't decide that a future board of education couldn't say we want that to remain a park and now the school district's in the park business um, but <laughs> typically the school district's not there's just a um, deviation there um, fair question has the school district considered eminent domain for the boundless property uh, that is always an option um, so the school district does have um, the power of eminent domain um, our, our current you know, as a community partner, we'd like to negotiate with Boundless. We think that makes the most sense. We don't want to get in the habit of taking property by eminent domain. That's um, not typically a uh, good community partnership. Um, but I will tell you, if we ever felt like that that, that was the, um, that the community really felt like a school needed to be on that site, and that was the only way to obtain the property, then that was something we would consider. Um, so that's certainly not off the table, but we're going to go through the negotiation process because um, we think that's the right thing to do. Sorry, um, so the Worthington Park District um, strategic plan suggests a stretch of, I'm not, using, I'm not sure I'm using the right words here, but a park along the east edge for bikes and foot traffic. Can we build this in? Um, I, I, so obviously we as a district would like to see our schools be walkable as much as possible. So um, I can't promise that we can build that in. I don't totally understand exactly where that is but it doesn't, nothing jumps off the pages outside the realm of possibility there. Yeah, this is a good question. So how is putting the school at the boundless site going to affect the traffic flow on Indian Hall Park Overlook and walking pattern with it being in a less centrally located area of the community? Um, I think it certainly changes the pattern. Uh, there, there's absolutely no question about that. Um, I would project, although we haven't done a traffic study, I would project that you have less traffic in the actual Colonial Hills neighborhood 
because you're going to be able to run your buses and a number of your cars off of 161 into the site. Uh, but it's certainly, um, it, you know, if I'm if I live at the Indian Ola Park Overlook kind of nexus right there, um, you probably have almost no traffic now, and it would probably create some traffic up that way. Um, certainly at morning drop off and pickup times. Um, so I, I mean, there, there's no question about that. What's the reason for building a new school? Is it only to bring things up to code? Um, you know, it's not just to bring things up to code, it's to bring all of the things behind the walls up to a more modern standard. Um, so, you know, when you, when you look at building a new school, you're trying to create a learning space for the next 60 years. Colonial Hills was a good space for the last 60 years. It's not a flexible space for us. Again, it doesn't have a lot of space for small group instruction for a lot of the pieces that we're, that we're trying to do. It's, it's, it is um, obviously a very tight space. It's certainly not up to code, but code's not the only um, factor here. It really is starting your school on a different life cycle, um, so it lasts much longer. If you acquire the land, could there be another option for that space if the taxpayers choose not to fiscally support to build a school on that space? Yeah, yeah I mean, I, so again, um, we would be acquiring the land with the idea of building a school on that space. If, as a community, we don't support um, in the future, building a school on that space, then the district will have to decide um, what happens to that space. Um, and so that has happened in the past. Like, I don't have all of the specifics, but again, the district has acquired pieces of land thinking they were gonna build. Um, where the Bazell Road Rec Center sits right now, if you go north, um, I believe, I'm looking at Jennifer, but I believe that was the land that we had acquired to build a fourth middle school in the district. Um, in the early 90s. And multiple times the district tried to pass bond issues to build a middle school up there um, and failed them. Um, and then decided to re-renovate Kilbourne Middle School as a middle school. It wasn't supposed to renovate, it was going to be the Worthington Education Center. Um, and because they couldn't pass a bond issue, eventually that land was utilized. I don't know if the district sold the land or what happened, but was utilized for a different purpose than they had envisioned. So there is history to that. By the way, fun fact, that is why we have two schools in Worthington called Kilbourne, right? So who has a middle school and a high school in the same district with the same name across town from each other? Well, Kilbourne was the freshman building that was to close and never reopen again when Kilbourne High School opened. So the name left the building and went to Worthington Kilbourne High School in 1991 because the building was never gonna reopen again as a school best laid plans. <laughs> so now we have to, and you would be shocked at the number of people from other communities that show up at the wrong place and can't figure out where there's not a football stadium. And, um, well, we have two schools with the same name. What? So that's what happened. Um, so I, and I just say that to say it's totally possible. Like we, you know, we, um, we hope that, that our community is supportive. This has historically been a very supportive community for schools, uh, but there's never guarantees. So it is possible that we purchase this land now, um, and in the future something happens where the school district says, you know, we thought we were going to do this, but we're gonna have to come back to our community with different plans. So. Um, can we review the commission on the current state of Colonial Hills, given that the roof and mechanicals have been updated? Um, certainly we can, um, but the, I think the only part of the roof that's been updated is the, is the um, gym roof, right? And that was a necessity, because water damage. Uh, we'll be able to see the estimate of rebuild costs before a decision is made. Absolutely. So, well, okay, great question. So we'll be able to see an estimate of rebuild cost before we decide whether we negotiate to purchase this land, um, what we could do is say, here's what a typical elementary of this square footage costs um, based on current dollars. Like that's fairly readily available on a, a per square footage cost to, to build a school. That we would have. Um, we would have much more specifics before we go out to a community in 2022 and say, here's what we're proposing. Um, Will not redistrict and continue to lose, why not redistrict and continue to use Colonial Hills as it is? Well, that's a great question. So the question is, why don't we just redistrict and move kids out of Colonial Hills essentially? And the, the honest answer is we have nowhere to move. 
So all of our elementary schools are full. We have six modular classrooms at Evening Street, plus already we've moved their sixth grade out. We have two modular classrooms at Blessview. We have four modular classrooms um, at Worthington Hills this year. Worthington Estates is, is right there um, as far as you know the need for current modular classrooms. We just don't have space. Um, I would say probably you have to redistrict some kids into Colonial Hills if you if you build the school of 600 to 650 students. It would, you know, when we talk about adding capacity, that means we need we would move some students from somewhere else into the Colonial Hills capacity, um, into our current space. Well, the site opened through traffic from 161. Again, that's not our intention, right? Our intention is to have access to 161, but we've heard really clearly that people do not want 161 to Indian Ola to connect. Um, again, we'd have to work with the city on that to make sure that they would be agreeable to that and whether that fits you know, codes and those types of things. But from a school district standpoint, um, we're not looking for, for cross traffic, um, although we do think there needs to be access from the Colonial Hills neighborhood. Again, I think you would want that. Um, if I heard correctly, most all traffic, aside from Colonial Hills residents, would be routed through 161. I mean, I think naturally they would, it's just easier, right? So I live um, across from Thomas Worthington High School. Much easier for me if I'm going to a new Colonial Hills Elementary to go down 161 and turn right than it is for me to weave down Colonial Avenue and up the hill and all those types of things. So I think the average person who doesn't live in the neighborhood would just find themselves going 161. Um, to that school. I can't speak for everybody, but I just think that that makes a lot of sense. So I think you actually do reduce traffic through the neighborhood. Um, so. Would the district uh, be willing to have an architect create rendering of what a replacement bill at current Colonial Hills could look like? Um, I'd like to see a vision for this. That's a good question. Um, that's not something we've talked about at this point. I don't know what that would cost um, to, to do that. Um, so honestly, probably not, um, although I can't speak for our Board of Education. I only say that to say um, we didn't create renderings ahead of time for what like a Worthing Way would look like before we went to the community or a Perry would look like. We worked through the design process once we've had that funded. Uh, we probably do that based on when a community task force says, hey, what does it look like? Where does Colonial Hills fit in this master facility plan? Does it get into phase two um, like, it, like we projected that it did? Right. So, okay. yep. um, Jeff or Jeff? I'll let you answer this because I don't know the answer. What's the process when Worthington School District sells a property? So, for instance, could the boundless property be purchased and resold? And, and similarly, what happens with the current Colonial Hill site? Like, if we were to try to sell the current Colonial Hill site? Um, so, any property that we have can, can be sold. And so, if, if we were to be successful in partnering with boundless and purchasing that property, it could be sold. Um, it's required to be sold by public auction. So if we, if we hold real estate, uh, it has to be sold at public auction. It can't be a negotiated purchase with, with someone else. Okay, so will there be additional opportunities for community input? Um, at, at this point, we don't have additional opportunities scheduled. We, we sent um, a couple emails to 22,000 people um, throughout the district, um, trying to provide our rationale, um, obviously invited folks to this community meeting. So we have received input um, from people um, that, that aren't here tonight. Um, and then obviously we're gonna receive the input we have tonight. Um, and then we'll talk about where we are um, at our next board meeting, which is Monday night. Um, so there's always public comment at, at our board meetings. And then we'll kind of regroup and figure out where we go from there. When does the district need to respond to boundless with, a, with an agreement to negotiate? Um, fairly soon. Um, we don't have a date on the calendar, um, but, but their expectation is that, that they knew we were gonna have this community meeting. I was very upfront when they said, hey, we'd like to partner with you. Immediately I said, we need to go out and socialize this with our community. So that's not a surprise in that process. 
Um, but we'll need to make a decision whether we want to negotiate or not um, relatively quickly. And then does each phase of the master facility plan meet additional bond issues for many years in the future? And the, the answer is yes, um, it really does. And so, um, you know, the, the district um, financially bond issues are, are one side, those are for capital improvements, it's like a bucket of funds. Operating issues are a separate bucket of funds. Operating issues go to fund essentially the service aspect of the school district, mostly the salary and benefits of employees because we're a service industry. So that's 90% of our operating funds are to fund the people that work with kids. That's what we do in a school district. We have over 1,300 employees that every day work with our students, and so that's the operating side. Um, under Ohio law, operating funds don't grow over time, so there's no inflationary increase in operating funds. And we've talked about it a lot, but we're a capped school district, which means our state funding is capped. So even though we grew this school year by almost 400 students, we don't get any more money from the state of Ohio for those 400 students. Our, our money was capped. Um, and so over time, as you continue to add students, you need to add more staff members to work with those students that come to the school district. You have to come back periodically to a community, especially a suburban community, based on the way school funding works in Ohio, to ask for operating levy increases. Bond money um, is, is debt that you issue. So we actually um, sell bonds to fund these projects and we pay those bonds back over a period of time, say a 15 year period of time. Our bond issue that we passed in 2012 was all new debt that we took out to fund the $85 million worth of projects that were in phase one of the master facility plan. Um, in phase two in around 2022, most of that would have to be all new debt that the district would take out and commit to pay back over time. In the 2026-27 range, we have a, a, a significant amount of debt that kind of rolls off, meaning we've paid off other projects. And it may be projects that are even like Worthington Kilbourne High School. So some of those major projects from the past get paid off. We could come to the community um, with some portion that's no new millage, meaning we're gonna ask you to pay what you're currently paying, but if you continue to pay that, instead of roll, instead of that debt going away, we can issue new debt without people paying more in tax for that. So that's kind of where you see. Our 2012 bond issue was what we called a no new millage bond issue. What that meant was residents wouldn't pay more taxes than they were currently paying and we could issue more debt. However, by saying yes, their tax bill didn't decrease like it would have, okay? So, and that's, that's how school districts fund um, properties. Now, we are working with the Ohio Facilities Construction Commission on our current middle school projects. Um, we, are, we have signed those agreements and our board will pass some resolutions to continue those agreements um, on next Monday night. By doing that, we capture some potential rebates through the state of Ohio's facility commission that will be paid back to Worthington in the future. So we think that when our number, school districts all have a number in the state of Ohio based on wealth factor, when ours is reached, we could receive about $15 million back from the state of Ohio that could be utilized to build another school by building to the Ohio facilities construction standards now. Right, so we've committed to build to those standards now with the promise that eventually there will be a rebate that comes back from the state of Ohio. And so you sometimes see projects that are co-funded by the state of Ohio. Those are typically rebate type co-funds. For Worthington, we're in a 15% range um, of, those, of those projects. So I guess it's not 15 minutes, closer to eight. So, okay, any other questions that I missed, anything? I'm just curious, but when you leave here, what's your sense of the community? What's your, what are going to be your takeaways? Well, first of all, we want to read your forms, right? So we are going to ask that, that everybody um, give us feedback on those forms. Um, that's going to be important to us. Um, part of my takeaway is you guys were very nice to me. Um, I mean, I, I, you know, because I woke up this morning and I thought, I wish I had more specifics that we could share. Because if I'm personally coming to a meeting like this, I want to know 
What's the building look like? Exactly where it's going to go? What's the plan for the current site? All of those types of things. And I don't think that's unrealistic for people to want. We're just way too far ahead of that phase. We're just, you know, we had we had this opportunity that we didn't expect to look at land that we didn't project we would have. We think it makes a lot of sense, but we want to get that feedback from the community. I will say anecdotally, most people throughout the general community have said, you know what, that's a really good opportunity. It's something the school district should take. Um, that's the feedback I get. Now, my assumption could be making bad assumptions, but my assumption is tonight was going to be more people that are impacted directly by the decision than the general public, right? And so obviously we have to weigh those that are impacted closely to the decision and what are their feelings, and then how do we look at the entire district and how additional capacity and those types of things would help the entire district. Jeff, this is your question. Um, when a property is sold at auction and there's a profit, what occurs with the profit? So if we auction, if we have oh. to auction off the current school site, yeah. where does that money go? It goes, it goes to us, and it's deposited into a, a permanent improvement fund that we can use for maintenance of all the facilities within the school district. But it has to go for capital needs. It has to go for capital. Yes, it cannot go to operating dollars. Okay. Yeah, the state really separates those buckets, right? The, that operating capital buckets. Um, the next question was, and it's a good question: Can we return the, the forms via email? And absolutely, so there is an email address on there. I'm kind of looking over your shoulder. Down at the bottom, um, it's the Worthington Schools communication email. So if you don't have a form, but you just want to email us, if, you can grab one by Mrs. Hudson. Um, but if you if you just want to email your feedback back, feel free to do that. Um, so if you don't want to write tonight, if you don't like using pens anymore, those types of things, that's fine. Um, if you are writing your feedback, um, if you leave them on your chair or just stick them on the table, that would be Totally fine. So. Do you have a quick response? You know, for the next slide, I think the email, the feedback is on there. Thank you. Down at the bottom, wscoms at wscloud.org. What's the most cost effective plan out of all these instead of buying the property? Is it more cost effective to go to Southfield? So that the question was, would it be most cost effective to build on Southfield? Um, I, I don't know. Honestly, you, you could you could potentially say yes because it would um, you wouldn't have to purchase property, um, you wouldn't have to demolish buildings, um, but you still have a site that's only about six acres on that side, and that's still a challenge, right? I mean, it's it's a different configuration. But, but I do think because it's only six acres, you're still looking at a two-story school with challenges for buses and cars. Um, not quite the challenges on the actual driveway in that you have on the current corner of the site, but the road is a lot more challenging. Just, just moving. So that would be part of my concern there is moving cars and traffic on south of the street, that road itself. But you can do it. Good question. Sherry, do you know what the number of buses is each day? So currently we have three buses that go in and go out, and that's probably 100, 200 students, 100 and so Probably 175 students that are bused in every day. Okay, we want your feedback. So if you leave your form on your chair, we'll get it. If you put it on the table, we'll get it. If you email us, we'll get it. Um, and sincerely, thank you for coming out tonight. <laughs>